Good morning. How's everyone doing? Excellent, excellent. I wanted to just ask you guys a question, kind of going way back in the sock drawer memory-wise here. Our very first meds ed that we ever did was back in February of 2015, and it happened to be on the same topic we're covering here today, diabetes. How many of you guys or any of you guys were in that very first session? Well, this is actually different content. So this is not really a repeat of that first diabetes session. This is kind of the 2.0 version with a little bit more of a focus on insulin. When we asked people, what would you like us to kind of zero in on? That was a, a resounding theme, it was a little bit bigger, more focused understanding of uh, insulin protocols. So that's hopefully what will drive our content here today, which we'll be getting started with momentarily. Here's kind of a, a rough view of the agenda here today, but we're gonna be moving things around just a little bit. You'll see that we have the uh, nurse perspective scheduled as kind of your intro here at 8.15. Um, we're actually gonna swap that around and begin with the medication overview here today to kind of just get everyone with a, a common lingo and some of those different medications. Then that'll be followed by uh, the nurse's perspective uh, we'll focus a little bit in that segment on uh, diet, exercise, behavior, those kind of variables. Uh, we'll take a quick break, and then uh, we'll move into an examination of patient cases. And then we've got kind of a storeroom set up throughout the room over here with different devices we'll be taking a look at and doing some demonstrations and getting you comfortable on all that. Um, these are the key learning objectives that we'll be focusing on uh, this morning. You'll get some good education points on managing diet for diabetic patients. Uh, we'll talk a lot about insulin regimens, both the, uh, the pros and the cons for different uh, situations, uh, dosing based on blood glucose values, and then finally be able to really demonstrate how to use these tools and equipment really well when we're done with all this stuff. So we'll make sure it's very hands-on and interactive during that last part of the day. Uh, before we actually break into the content here today, and Tara comes up and starts talking about moving down to where medications and patient cases will come to bear, just want to let you know a couple of updates on things that we're doing in the world of meds on here. I know a lot of you folks have seen the meds chart that we talk about pretty frequently on here. Um, we have revamped the meds chart a little bit for you in two very distinct ways here today. Um, one, the chart's got a new format that allows for a lot more medications per page on there. The original one we had only had four. And you'll see that this new version over here has got room for about 10 on there. It's also a little cleaner and simpler, and we have pads of those uh, for you over on this side table that you're welcome to uh, help yourselves to here today. But more importantly, you've got a, uh, a set of instructions and an example here of a new iteration of the meds chart. A lot of times with the patient population that's in a hurry going to have their visit with the provider, they may not feel comfortable filling out a whole lot of extra forms or trying to write out a lot of different medication names that are, let's be honest, hard enough to pronounce and spell anyway. So uh, we're letting folks know now that if you're gonna be doing any kind of a medication review with a patient, be it a you know, nurse, provider, pharmacist, whatever, let us know in advance that you're gonna be needing to schedule one of those reviews and we can prepare for you a pre-filled meds chart like the example you see here. So all the medications are plugged in for you in advance and it'll have additional empty pages on there as a fillable document so you can add more medications that you may describe. So it kind of makes the whole <laughs> review process of a patient's medications a lot more efficient and there's less transcribing of medication names by anybody. So uh, the instructions on how to do that are included uh, right there for you. It's very straightforward or you can just call and uh, leave a voicemail for me if that's easier for you. And uh, we're happy to provide those for you as needed and deliver them to you securely. Yeah. Uh, Right now, we're, it's a brand new process, and uh, we are striving to get them done within 24 hours, if we can. I mean, it uh, kind of depends on workflow and availability, but so far we've been exceeding that. Um, it kind of just depends uh, how things take off. We're, you're one of the first groups that we've been talking to, trying to socialize this, but we do not want to keep it a secret. Uh, we think it's a real 
thing that will help employ the chart more and get it out there for, for members to take advantage of. So by all means, feel free to share this information. I'll be sending one of these to you guys electronically afterwards as well. And then a little sneak preview of something else we're working on, and then we'll go ahead and get started here. We've found a lot of times when uh, members come in and do their med reviews, how many of you people have seen members come in to do a medication review with their doctor or pharmacist for a brown bag, and they're, they're bringing in like paper bags full of different medications, and you get the sense that there's a lot of chaos involving how the medications are kept, and you're, we've heard a common theme that, that it would be easier if people could store those medications together somehow. So this is kind of an early prototype of something we're going to be piloting in the fall, but we want to be able to provide members with the medication bags like this. If they were to come in and do a review of their medications, we could give them one of these as kind of an incentive. This will hold up to about 16 different medication bottles, or it'll hold the, uh, the pre-filled, you know, weekly, daily, things like that. Uh, they're doing a review with the pharmacist. They can print out a copy of their meds chart for them, the one that's pre-filled there. So kind of takes the review process and maybe sends them out in a little bit more organized fashion with hope that they'll be more engaged around their medications after. And this is something that, that they can have a practical use to. So swag with a purpose, if you will. So uh, look for more information on that. And if you're interested in trying out some prototypes, maybe if you have a, someone in mind that you think that might be a good fit for, email me and we can get you on the early wave of testing those out. So enough of my talking here to start with, guys. Let me advance the deck a little bit here for us. And I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit to the land of medications to take us through that part of our demonstration here today. I can think of no one better suited to do that than the fabulous Tara Berkson, our Meds Ed coordinator. Give Tara a big welcoming round of applause. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Great way to start the day with medications. Of course, I always think it's a great way to start the day. Um, so what I want to start off by asking folks is how many of you routinely provide um, diabetes education to patients? And by routinely, I mean at least once a week. So about half of you. How about, um, how about once a month, maybe, or so you're providing diabetes education? Great, and people who never do it or do it very infrequently. Okay, so most of you are, doing, are providing education to patients routinely, and so what we wanted to focus today's session on is, of course, insulin. Insulin can be really tricky, it can be also really helpful, and once you kind of get it down pat and patients get it down pat, it can be really valuable for them too. Um, and so everyone gets insulin, right, like Oprah says. So how many of you have seen um, a graph like this before. So quite a few, right? So it just shows the, um, the kind of the peak and duration of the different insulin formulations. I like this graph because it's pretty simple. It kind of, it doesn't have too many different lines and formulations on there, but it just kind of shows you your, you know, your onset and duration of the, the rapid acting regular intermediate, which is NPH, and long acting. So what this um, graph does not show is that Levomir, you know, when it first came out was thought of to not have a peak, but we actually know now it does have a small peak. So that's what this graph shows a little bit more, um, is the, you know, this is um, a little bit more detailed, a little bit messier. But what I like about this graph is this peak on the very far left that is our endogenous, non-diabetic, that is our insulin response to food. So you can see how with insulin we're trying to mimic that, but we're not quite getting there, right? Look how fast this happens. You know, it's almost even before we start eating, our natural in, um, response is, our natural insulin response is starting to kick in. So our patients with diabetes, that's not happening, right? So we need to replace it with insulin, yes. Um, both. Okay, because I thought Lantus was eight hours. Or I mean, I'm sorry, not onset, it's the peak. You're right, yeah. Is that what it's showing? So the, it's showing this kind of flat graph here, um, which, of course, since it's extending over the 24 hours. Yeah, so it's showing kind of a flat graph. So with Lantus, we're seeing kind of a little bit of a flatter graph. Detamir was showing a little bit of a peak, but this graph doesn't really re represent that. That's why I kind of 
like this one a little bit better. Um, yeah, so this kind of shows the endogenous and then also the rapid acting and then a few of the, um, the mixed insulins as well. So it's just showing a little bit of an idea of what you're looking at when you're checking out different types of insulin. So more graphs, pharmacists got to start the day off with all the graphs. So we, um, you know, what we're trying to do with an insulin regimen, especially a patient that's on um, multi-dose insulin, so both basal and bolus insulin, we're trying to mimic your body's natural response, right? So as you can see, this is a person who doesn't have diabetes. This is what their natural response would look like. And so they eat a meal, their insulin goes up, they, you know, then it dips down and this happens pretty quickly. And so that's what we're trying to mimic with insulin. And so time for a little quiz, since a lot of you are pretty familiar with insulins, um, what we're going to do is you see a lot of nice pictures up here, pens and vials. And so what we're going to do is, and if you, aren't as familiar, you can maybe cheat a little bit. But we are gonna start with, we're gonna start at the fastest and go to the longest. So what are the rapid acting insulins that we have to use? Yeah, you can just shout them out. Yeah, Novolog and Humalog. And what's the usual onset of those? Yeah, yeah, say it really loud, 15 minutes. And what do we expect the duration to be? Three hours? Yeah, about three hours. Anyone have different experience than that? Great, excellent. And so what about our short-acting insulins? What are our short-acting insulins? Regular and R. Yeah, regular and R. We've heard of them both ways, right? And um, what is the onset of our short-acting insulins? Say it, say it real loud, I heard it. 30 minutes, exactly, exactly. And so why is that important to know that distinction between rapid and short? When to take them. Yeah, exactly, when to take them. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? So you want, we want people to take Novolog and Humalog before they start eating, but then eat right away. That's really important to have people go slow because they take it and then they wait and make their meal and then they go low. Yeah. So just to recap, in case someone didn't hear you, you know, with the Novolog and the Humalog, the rapid acting, if, you, if a patient takes their insulin and then, you know, runs over to, you know, play with their grandchild then, and they don't eat their meal right away, um, they run the risk of going low since it happened, it, um, you know, the onset is so rapid. But with short acting insulin, our regular insulin, since it has that half hour window, it's almost like a little bit of the opposite. If they take it too close to their meal, then they might end up going a little bit low after because the onset is hitting not quite at the right time. So that's something important to keep in mind. What about our intermediate acting insulin? Which one is that? Exactly. And what's the onset of NPH? One to two hours. And then what do we expect the duration to be? Oh, I'm hearing a lot of different answers. Yeah, it's, it's pretty variable. So, I mean, sometimes our documentation says 24 hours, but how do we usually see NPH dosed in patients? Twice a day. Yeah, it's dosed twice a day. So we're thinking of it as, you know, not a once a day dosing insulin. And then our long acting insulins. What, which ones are those? Levomir Lantus. Yeah, Levomir Lantus. Um, and what do we expect the duration of our long-acting insulins to be? Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh, you all could come up here and, and teach this. So we have kind of, we wanted to do kind of a nice framework because I think this is really the cornerstone, right? As far as when you're looking at a patient's insulin regimen or talking to a patient about how to check their blood sugar or when to check it and when to dose their insulin, that's kind of the cornerstone is knowing the onset and the duration and which insulin it is because um, you know, that's something too sometimes patients can get a little bit confused about. How many of you have seen a situation where a patient was taking their long-acting insulin, PRN as needed, or dosing it as a sliding scale? Yeah, I've seen it. And how many of you have seen kind of where they weren't taking their long-acting insulin at all and were just taking their short-acting? 
Right, exactly. And there's probably a, a bunch of other scenarios that you've all seen in practice about patients, um, you know, getting on board and getting, getting up to speed and, and um, engaged in how to dose their insulin. So it's kind of a nice overview to do. So of course we have our insulin mixtures. Um, you know, our 70-30 is probably the most common. How many of you have patients on 70-30 right now? A couple? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about 70-30. How many of you have patients on 75-25? Probably not too many. What about 50-50? So the mixtures are, um, you know, their, their popularity, as we can see from your, you know, the use here, it can vary. And we're going to talk, Dr. Berteau is going to talk to us a little bit more about 70-30 and some interesting ways that it may be used. Um, so um, another thing to talk about with Lantus is how, um, when do you, you know, Lantus is dosed once a day, typically. When do you see patients now splitting their dose and taking their Lantus in the morning and in the evening? Yes. Erin, what? Well, there's some patients who are very convinced that they have to take it twice a day, and it seems that the practitioner is just going to go along with it because the patients are so convinced. But I don't know, is there any actual benefit to taking it twice a day? Well, it kind of depends. Has anyone seen a different circumstance where a patient's taking their Lantus twice a day? It, I think that's one of them, yes. Well, just splitting it when it was over 50 units that seemed to help, but then I heard that the research didn't back that up. But that was kind of recommended for a while. And I did see patients who did split their doses above 50 units and actually had improvement without increasing the dose. But then, like I said, I heard that the research showed that that shouldn't have made a difference. So I'm kind of confused about that. Yeah, so that was that's kind of exactly it is that some of the research shows that the um, absorption in the body of long-acting insulin, it basically you're, you're subcutaneous tissue can only hold so much insulin. So if you have a patient that's trying to inject 110 units at bedtime, you know, they're, one, they're gonna be poking themselves all over the place, and two, their, um, you know, their, their subcutaneous tissue just isn't gonna be able to absorb and then get that insulin all to their body. So I've heard the same thing. F at 50 units, you would then split, but I think that also varies in practice because I've also heard up to 80. So if a patient's up to 80, then you would, split and do you know 40 in the morning 40 in the evening now some caveats to that are if a patient's going to forget to take their morning insulin well then they'll, now they're only on 40 units right um, and then the same thing you know with what the example that aaron brought up if a patient is really on board with taking their insulin twice a day um, i mean there's really if they're only on you know 10 20 units it's if they're going to remember to take it both times a day, I guess, and they're really dedicated to doing that, I don't know if I'd convince them otherwise. But really, um, you know, if they're if if they're struggling with adherence, then I would try to bring them down to the one shot per day, just because you can. Medications only work when we take them, right? So if you're missing half of your in, your basal insulin dose, um, and then what's another thing to consider if you have a patient that's on that many, you know, 50, 60 units of Lantus? What's something else that you would want to look at in their insulin regimen? Additional medications. Yeah, additional medications. What what one do you think I'm thinking of offhand? Hmm. Yeah, who said short acting insulin? Say it really loud. Yeah, if you have a patient that's on 50 or 60 units of Lantus and they're on no meal time coverage or prandial coverage at all, that's something that should be kind of a, a red flag in your mind of, you know, they, they probably at that point are definitely needing that, that prandial coverage as well and that, um, you know, that basal insulin coverage isn't, isn't going to be cutting it for them. Yes? Is there an approximate number of units that they think, because you said you can only absorb some of it to your subcute tissue, I mean, is there like a number that they you know, I don't know the exact number. I don't know if anyone in the audience knows the exact number. I've heard 50, but then I've heard up to about 80. Um, so I don't know if they've done, I'm not familiar with an exact number that they've done, but um, I don't know if anyone else, is anyone else in the audience familiar? I think it varies. The endocrine clinic that I was in last year, they always split at 70, but I think everyone just has their own. Right, yeah, own preference, right? Yeah. Hmm? You, could, you could kind of safely uh, kind of think 50. 
Right, exactly. And and again, too, it's it's it is patient specific, like most insulin dosing, where you know if your patient is struggling, to, if they're going to really struggle to take that second dose of insulin, then you might want to bump it up to 70 or 80, because then at least they're getting that 50 or 60 versus 30 or 20, you know, 24 that they would be getting if they took it at night. But yeah, I've heard from 50 to about 80. Yes. Um, so when you're talking about splitting the dose, I, I usually see it split at the same time. So like in the morning, you inject, you know, 30 and 30, mm -hmm. just in two different spots, as okay. opposed to morning and evening. Is there, like if you're doing literally two different sides of your belly mm -hmm. at the same time, is there a concern that somehow your entire belly can't absorb that much, like the subcutaneous tissue in general? Or if it's in two different spots, that's fine because it's a local. I think it, it then depends on the patient, okay. you know, and like, again, if they're going to be, you don't forget. right, exactly. If they're going to forget the other 30 <laughs> units, yeah. then they might as well just do it at the same time. Okay. Yes. And then for orals, like usually, is it that they, I mean, I've seen different things, but Lantus is usually what they would start in addition mm -hmm. to, right? And then if it's getting high, then the 3070, is that what you're kind of saying? Well, um, well, I mean, I guess it depends on the patient, and we have a bunch of cases that we'll go through, and you can kind of see different. It depends on the patient, but yes, traditionally patients are started on orals, and then depending on the provider's preference, patient preference, they're uh, started on insulin, and then from there, a prandial coverage, which maybe perhaps used to be a sulfonylurea, and now is either switched to a short-acting insulin or maybe a GLP-1 agonist, depending on, um, and 7030 is an option too depending on the patient and the provider's comfort with using 7030. So we talked a little bit about adding prandial insulin. So this is a, um, this is just kind of a rule of thumb. So if a patient, you know, is not quite getting, um, if their blood sugars aren't at goal, we shouldn't be too, too resistant to adding prandial insulin or some sort of prandial coverage because that's gonna help the patient you know, get to their um, blood sugar goal. And so we don't want to wait too, too long, you know, maybe three to six months, you know, titrating the patient. Um, and even maybe even earlier, if they ha are, have close follow up with either a nurse care manager, a pharmacist, something like that, someone who can follow them closely. And so, um, you know, when you're starting prandial insulin, you'll start with the largest meal of the day. And this can also vary, but patient to patient, it's important to get a good sense of what the patient's eating, when they're eating, when um, their insulin doses are um, first started. Um, the important thing with adding prandial insulin is you definitely wanna continue their metformin if there's no other reason for them to stop it. So starting prandial insulin isn't a reason to stop metformin. Um, but you do, of course, wanna stop their sulfonylurea, so glipizide, gliburide, glimepuride, because that's prandial coverage. And at that point, what we're probably seeing is that their beta cell function is decreasing and the sulfonylurea is probably not providing them the benefit that they need. And so I wanted to move on to some of the other, what I say other medications for diabetes. So kind of beyond our first line medications, but I do wanna end when ta with talking about the insulin, um, kind of the insulin basics is I actually just heard this yesterday and I thought it was great that how many of you ladies have an essential black dress in your wardrobe? a dress that you can pull out, it goes with everything, you can wear it to anything. Gentlemen, maybe the equivalent is that essential black suit or essential um, you know, black pair of pants that you can just wear to anything. Well, we should consider insulin our essential black dress of diabetes therapy. Um, it's something that, you know, it kind of, you can adjust it to fit different patients um, and it's kind of always there when you need it and it's, you know, kind of uh, the cornerstone of diabetes therapy. So I do want to talk a little bit about GLP-1 agonists. So um, they've been in the news a little bit, which we'll talk about because we have a new one that was just approved a few weeks ago. Um, but GLP-1 agonists provide prandial, in, uh, prandial coverage. And one of the advantages is a low hypoglycemia risk because how GLP-1 agonists work is they only work in the presence of sugar. So unlike insulin, if you inject insulin and you haven't eaten, you're gonna go low. GLP-1 agonists um, have a lower hypoglycemia risk. They also have a more modest um, A1C lowering capability of about half of a percent to 1%. So side effects are similar to, you know, some GI side effects are the most common. Um, 
And then I have a few administration points here as far as which version, which GLP-1 agonists are once weekly versus, versus once daily. So I also wanted to talk about the DPP-4 inhibitors. So these are Genuvia, Anglinza, Trigenta, and Nacina, the glyptins, I also call them. Um, so these also decrease glucagon secretion, and so they have a low, um, and they um, increase insulin secretion, but they also have a low hypoglycemia risk. And um, you know, just keep an eye on them for uh, dosing for renal insufficiency. So how many of you have had patients on the SGLT2 inhibitors? So those are like the Invokana, Jardians. Can't get it covered, can't get it covered. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's new and it's expensive. And so, um, you know, a few things to point out about these is they have um, kind of, mo you know, low to moderate A1C lowering capability. Um, they increase urinary glucose secretion. So, as you, if you think about that, um, you know, the common side effects are UTIs, yeast infections, um, and then also some dehydration. So something to think about. Um, some of the advantages is, again, it's a low risk of hypoglycemia. It's also oral, so that's something that, um, you know, can be considered a low risk. But because they're new, they tend to be difficult to cover because of the cost. So I wanted to take a few seconds to just go over some of the handouts that you have in your packet and talk a little bit about some, just kind of some benefit info. So in your packet, um, in the front pocket, there's a few d diet and hypoglycemia handouts that Cheryl's gonna go into in a little bit. And then behind that, there's a few pharmacy handouts. So we have a page with our um, links to all of our criteria, forms, key phone numbers, and on the back of that page, you see this colorful handout with the red, yellow, red, um, yellow, green. And so what this is is just um, from Care Oregon's formulary and also kind of what's considered first-line therapy for diabetes medication. Um, we have kind of the greens, which is considered first-line therapy, things that we primarily cover on formulary and probably most plans do too. Um, the yellows, which may be considered more second line therapy, they may require PA, they may not be covered, it depends on the insurance. And then kind of the reds, which are either um, some of these older drugs that I don't know if anyone's even ever seen them in practice in the recent past. And then also some of our newer meds that wouldn't be covered. And so, um, but it also just has some really interesting, you know, kind of an at a glance, how the med works, its potential to reduce A1C, it, um, its effect on weight, whether weight gain, weight neutral, weight loss, um, its potential for hyper, hypoglycemia, and then just um, some other little notes. So it's just kind of a nice at a glance about diabetes meds if you want to um, refresh your memory or share it with a colleague. Then we also have um, some in the insulin profile, the, the more simple graph that I have, and then after that is a comparison of insulin formulations. So the table that has onset duration, all of the things that you were able to all pretty much know by heart. So this is just also a nice reference. It also has um, some info on insulins that can be mixed, ones that can't, and then storage as well, which is really important um, when educating patients of how long they can keep their vial or their pen in or out of the fridge, that kind of thing. So, and then at the very end of that, um, Rather than print you out hundreds and hundreds of patient education handouts, if your clinic already doesn't have kind of a routine um, place that you go to get handouts for patients, or if you don't have your own, I included some links to two. There's probably other ones on here, and so if there's ones that your clinic uses that you particularly like, feel free to send them to the link to Paul or myself, and we can circulate it with the group so we all have some nice patient education handouts um, at our fingertips. And so these are ones where you can just go to the website and either print them out or um, request that copies be mailed to your clinic. So I wanted to point out just some of those handouts and then also um, talk a little bit about some of the benefits, um, the pharmacy benefit related to GLP-1 uh, agonists, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT-2 inhibitors, and insulin pens. So how many of you are involved in the PA process at your clinic? A few of you. So like one of the key things that I think it's important for everyone to know is if you, if you have a patient that's a good candidate for one of these medications and you're working with your physician to bring, you know, or the person in your clinic who um, 
who submits PAs is to really always submit a PA with an A1C. That's kind of one of the first things, and our criteria are all online, so you can always look at them, but I think that's one of the first things that we're gonna look for, and so if you just get in a habit of that, if it's a diabetes med, submit an A1C, that just makes that process smoother um, so your patient can get their medication a little bit quicker. Um, so that's kind of one thing, and then with insulin pens, you know, the vials, of course, are on formulary, they're, um, they can be really useful for patients as well. And then pens, you know, do require a PA and just documentation of inability to use the vial and the syringe. Yes, Erin. So a PA, how current does the A1C need to be? If you're starting on a new med, you need to redraw A1C before No, I would say like if the, you know, the most recent A1C, and I, I mean, I, we don't have like a limit in which we say, nope, that's too old. I mean. Of course, if you're starting them on a new med and the A1C is three years old, that's gonna be a little bit of a red flag. Um, but I would say their most recent A1C. Yes. And then for the PAs, for the pens, it's there, there's visual problems, there's dexterity problems, or cognitive, or what's, what's the other, is there just the two kind of dexterity issues? Yep, visual? and if they're just unable to use the syringes and the pens, you know, from, yeah, for, from dexterity, cognitive, vision, though sometimes, so though there has been some kind of um, a very small poster done at the ADA conference last year that showed that actually patients with vision, um, with vision problem, vision impairment actually had a harder, their doses of insulin were less accurate with the pens than with the vials, which is interesting and not expected. But um, Cheryl's had some interesting experiences with pens too that I think she'll be able to share with us of um, patients with low vision having a hard time even seeing the pen needle. But most patients do have a b easier time with the pens because they can hear the clicks, right? So they know how many units they're drawing up because of the clicks. Yes. Would you consider insulin pens for um, patients who, for social reasons, can't store insulin or it's not safe for them to have needles, like homeless patients or people living in? Yeah, and that would be a case-by-case -case basis, but definitely, if that's the reason that the decision's being made, then make sure that that's communicated so we can do a review based on that. I've gotten PAs for pens approved many times for people with needle phobia and from Care Oregon. And um, for instance, people who've had a history of IV drug use mm -hmm. and they, they're in recovery, they really don't want to be using the syringes. So that's another way I've gotten PA from yeah, my patients. Exactly, and it's really just about making sure that that's really clear, like you know, the provider's decision is really clear and then we review it on a case by case. Definitely for patients that it's inappropriate for them to have syringes in their home. So I do wanna talk about what's coming up, a few things that are coming up in the pipeline. So I feel like a lot of, a lot of us, even providers, nurses, pharmacists especially, we're a little bit like Dory in this, right? We're like, this drug is the best, we're really managing patients well with this, with this therapy. Oh wait, look over here, there's something new. And so I thought this was really fun um, related to insulin therapy. And also, you know, we've had a lot of new classes of drugs of insulin uh, uh, not insulin, of diabetes therapy come out within maybe the last 30 years, right? Um, for those of you who've been in practice 20 plus years, there were what, one or two classes of drugs and now there's 12. So it's just something where it is growing quite a bit and we have a lot of patients that have diabetes. So um, Adelixin is a new GLP-1 inhibitor just fresh, fresh off the press. Um, it's a once daily injection. It's, it's kind of, you know, there. It's similar in efficacy and safety to all of the other GLP-1 agonists. Um, it's cardiovascular neutral, so meaning it doesn't have provide, a, it's not, wasn't shown to provide a benefit, nor was it shown to provide a risk. Um, it's really doesn't, it's not anything earth shattering within this class of drugs where we al already have several options, except that the makers of Adelixin have this in the pipeline. Um, they have a one syringe um, combination of insulin, glargine, and their GLP-1 agonist in the pipeline, so it hasn't yet been approved. And then I also just heard yesterday that there's a second product that's gonna be similar that's also in the pipeline, not yet approved. And so that's something to, to um, keep your eye out for, and really we'll be watching to see what the evidence shows on these formulations and how we would even use them, what their, benefit, what their benefits and risks are. So that's something that we would expect coming out pretty soon. Has anyone heard anything about this combination? I, either I was dreaming or I saw a commercial last night on TV about once a week injection. Yep, so there are some GLP-1 agonists that are once a week. 
So by durian, tansian, trulicity, there are already um, three once a weeks available. When would that be? So a patient that would be, well, uh, I guess it kind of depends on the individual patient, but um, you know, a patient that's a GLP-1 agonist, so, and it's a long acting, so obviously, because it's once a week. So it would be a patient that would be a good candidate for a GLP-1 agonist, but perhaps, um, you know, wouldn't be able to be compliant with the once daily dosing of insulin, um, but they would still benefit from a long acting insulin. So it's something to think about with that. Yes. I've actually had a really wonderful experience with the Vidurian once weekly with a patient who I've worked with for about four years and we didn't budge the A1C below about 12 and we were always unsure if insulin was happening at home. It was really complicated um, and I'm doing weekly nurse visits and administering it. And wow. we had a five point A1C drop over the course wow. of months. Which so like the, 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 with Vidurian. Um, so like it with compliance issues where either you know it's not happening at home or there's something really weird happening that you just can't figure out despite heroic attempts. Um, I think of it like mental health meds that are administered like once mm -hmm. a week or once a month in a clinic for that like compliance and regularity and relationship thing. Um, and it's, it's been brilliant in that, in that situation. Right. And that's definitely something to consider. And yeah. especially for your patient that perhaps wasn't taking any medications, right? And so adding on that one once a weekly, um, and perhaps maybe it encouraged that patient to start taking some of their other meds, who knows, yeah. yeah. So it's definitely one to consider. I thought I saw another hand too of if anyone had heard of this or, yeah, Jess. One thing that I heard about it that could be a potential advantage, I'm not sure if they've actually looked at it in trials yet, but the thought that the titration of the GLP-1 would be so much slower than with the other meds that, patients might tolerate it better from the GI standpoint. So that was something that people are hoping will be better yeah. for this versus the other GLP ones because you're titrating very, very slowly with the charging. So. Interesting. Well, stay tuned. We'll see, we'll see what happens when we get those trials and we have a chance to take a look at them. And so I just want to end with, um, you know, as I mentioned before, knowing the onset and duration of the different insulins really helps you look at a patient's list and then, or a patient's regimen and really work with them on one, adherence, and two, un, you know, understanding, are they comfortable with that regimen and is it the best one for them? Um, and are, are there things that you can recommend to the provider or talk with the patient about related to their insulin? You know, our essential black dress or black suit that we have at home. And so with that, actually, we're going to back it up and invite Cheryl up um, to, uh, to share a little bit about her perspective.